China, thank you for taking care of mom's letters. All right, we're, we're going to get started. I've got some announcements. Um, Chris Fisher is with us tonight. He's back in Clinton, uh, room seven at the hometown inn. Um, Danny King had some issues with his kidney function, and they're going to make some adjustments to his medication. He asked for our prayers. Uh, Joanne Rowland, that's uh, Dallas Payne's sister, fell on Sunday, <clears throat> a little banged up, but they discovered a cyst on her adre adrenaline gland and is cutting off blood supply to the kidney. So keep her in your prayers. We've been praying for Eric Kramer. Uh, he's had some work done on his heart, and he's awaiting a transplant. So keep him in your prayers. Uh, Steve Smith uh, had a biopsy. There are no cancer cells at all. And so good news. Uh, and he's going to continue to get better. Um, Kim Treese's friend, Julie Houchin, uh, has stage four lung cancer and lost her husband just four weeks ago with cancer. So keep her in your prayers. Hudson Smith, uh, uh, Becky's grandson, is uh, doing well after having strep throat. Um, also, uh, remember Ellie McCormick? She's an adult now and out of high school, and I'm sure she's shouldering those responsibilities well. Uh, Richard and Gia are now old people, and they have a graduate daughter, so keep them in your prayers. Um, the trip to the New Mexico Christian Children's Home has been canceled for this summer. Uh, their board met over the weekend and decided not to have any groups uh, come to their campus this summer. So we won't be do going to the uh, Children's Home in New Mexico. Now, our food pantry is up and running. Um, we are going to be open on Wednesdays from 9 to 3. So if you have anyone you know of that needs food, uh, we're open from 9 to 3. We'll make deliveries if we have to. Um, so just let us know. But from 9 to 3, if you want to help man that, you need to call Win Smith and we'll start scheduling uh, people to be up here. We need, uh, I don't know, three or four every Wednesday uh, to be on hand. Uh, we will rebox uh, boxes as, as we give them away. So if, if you can help with that, see when. But that'll be starting this Wednesday. So keep that in your prayers. Um, so far, we have collected more money than we've spent on our food pantry. So we need to we need to change that because right now we wouldn't qualify for a nonprofit. Uh, we are making more money than we're spending right now. But uh, your generosity is appreciated. Um, and if you need more communion supplies, please just let Joyce know. And we'll see that they get that to you. Um, is there anyone else we need to mention before we start? Any announcements we've got on there that or prayer needs? Anything? Let's have a prayer. And then in our ongoing effort to improve our Bible classes, we have switched uh, to a higher quality teacher uh, for the next few weeks. Um, and so we're going to we're going to take a step up in our production here. Uh, as, as we go along, we just get better and better. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer, please? Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to look at your word and we pray for your wisdom, Father and the courage to make it part of our life. We pray for those that we have named tonight. We lift them up to you in prayer, knowing that you care and that you see and that you know our hearts and our concerns and our anxieties. We pray, Father, your presence in their life and your healing in their lives. We pray, Father, that you be with their families as they go through these times of struggle. Use us, Father, to be the voice of your care and your love in this community. Use us, Father, to be the demonstration of that love and help us, Father, to voice the words you want us to speak. We pray all these things in the name of your son. Amen. Amen. All right. Holton is now going to teach our class. There you go. Awesome. Awesome. That's the camera, right? All right. Okay. So um, my name is Holton, by the way. Most of you probably know that. If you don't, that's my name. Uh, I've worked here some previous summers, and uh, it's been really enjoyable. So that's kind of what it is. My instructions for uh, this Bible study were, you know, keep it under 30 minutes for threat of death. And, uh, <laughs> otherwise, you can kind of go wild. Uh, <laughs> kidding. Um, but I decided that just kind of opening my Bible, scrolling through it, looking through it, I decided Isaiah might be something pretty 
interesting to look at. It's a book that uh, oftentimes is kind of reserved for, you know, prophetic prophecies about Jesus later on. So I figured we could kind of look at Isaiah uh, while I'm doing the Bible studies and kind of go through it and start at the beginning uh, and kind of see what the book has to say. Um, so a little background about Isaiah before we get started, because I think that's kind of always important to uh, place uh, why the book was being written, or who it was being written to. Isaiah lived around 700 BC, so about 700 years before Christ was born. He lived during a time of a lot of turmoil for Judah. Uh, at that point, Israel and Judah had kind of split off into separate kingdoms. Uh, Israel had already been taken away into exile by the Assyrians, and Judah was all that's left. And they were facing a lot of trouble. Uh, they were facing this Assyrians who were much bigger and much stronger than them. Uh, and they were facing the very fact that the moral fabric of Judah was falling apart, so to speak. Uh, the people weren't concerned with worshiping God anymore. They were more concerned with their own, you know, problems, their own situations, or they liked worshiping idols more. Uh, and so the, the Israelites themselves were not in a very good place. Uh, they were not obeying God. They weren't doing anything. Essentially, the Israelites thought that because we keep sacrificing at the temple, we can do whatever else we want and we're going to be okay. Um, and so that's kind of the setting of Isaiah. So the question that I have, already asking questions, uh, is why is it important to study Isaiah? Because Isaiah is a prophet who is, you know, telling Israel to repent, telling Israel to get right. So why would it be important to study a book like Isaiah? Yeah. I was just thinking history repeats itself. We think, you know, we go to church on Sunday so we can do whatever any other time when we're not at church. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, Isaiah is one of one of Isaiah's major themes is repentance. He, he's calling on the Israelite people to repent, to uh, turn back to God. And like you guys are saying, that is a major thing for us as well. Uh, we are told repeatedly in the New Testament to repent, to turn back. And so, yeah, absolutely. I agree. I also think Isaiah kind of serves as a warning uh, about, you know, this is this is what happens when you start going down that path, so to speak. This is what happens when you uh, stop um, following God and when you are, you know, not focused on the right things. Uh, and so this book has a great deal to say about what it looks like when you fail to maintain faithfulness uh, to God, when they are happy to just practice idolatry and do whatever they want. Uh, Isaiah kind of gives a very big warning to them. I think another aspect of it is hope. Isaiah is teaching to people that uh, are disobeying and tells them that if you don't repent, you're going to face this judgment. And uh, he then goes into this idea that, but if you do repent, there is hope, there's grace. Uh, I kind of think of it this way as like, there's these buzzwords, so to speak, that we as Christians kind of uh, come around, fruits of the spirit, uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. I hope I just named all of them. Uh, and then, uh, you know, hope, grace, mercy. 
Uh, there's all these words that people kind of rely on and lean on, and that's uh, Isaiah is full of those. Isaiah has a lot of those kind of words. And more than that, Isaiah also has a vision for the future, um, a vision of things to come. He is a prophet, and so he is uh, teaching about the future or, or talking about the future and telling Israel what might happen, what could happen. And that's something that we as Christians have as well. We have or are supposed to have this vision of the future, uh, uh, the idea that we will continue to make this world better, that we will continue to get better, and that eventually we have um, the second coming of Christ to look forward to and what we're going to do. So in Isaiah itself, when we look at Isaiah I'm going to say that we don't start in Isaiah chapter one for the book. In fact, when you're studying Isaiah, usually the best place to start is in Isaiah chapter six. As I turn there, Isaiah is before Jeremiah. It is the first of the major prophets, not because they're better than the minor prophets, just because they're much longer. Um, so Isaiah chapter six. And the reason you, uh, the idea is to start in Isaiah chapter 6 is because Isaiah chapter 6 is the call of Isaiah. Uh, it's his call story, essentially how he begins to prophesy, what kind of makes him want to prophesy. And so in chapter 6, I'll just read it. It says, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. So we'll stop right there and talk a little bit. So the question I have again is what stands out uh, in these first couple of verses, verses about Isaiah's call? Like what kind of jumps out to you as being important or, or to note, or what is the meaning of what's happening right here? Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely think that that's true. Um, I think that what's happening here is that the Lord's really almost making a statement, so to speak. Uh, he is showing off, but not in a bad way, in a way that kind of is meant to catch Isaiah's attention. Uh, the way I kind of like to think about it here is Israel has not paid attention to God for a long time at this point. They've ignored God. They've ignored his commands. Uh, they don't really want anything to do with God. And now we have this prophet who sees a vision of God that is impossible to miss. It is impossible to ignore. Um, I think that's kind of important because it's showing that even if Israel no longer you know, pays any attention to God, even if Israel is done with God. God is still his mighty and majestic self. He's still above everything else. And so I think that's a very important uh, kind of idea that they have right here. I also think that, uh, you know, you kind of see the theme of what God is supposed to be kind of viewed as or how God is uh, supposed to be interacted with. You have these... Uh, <clears throat> Seraphim who are, who are chanting almost or singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And this we see this here in Isaiah. Uh, 
even in Revelation later on, this kind of uh, idea of holy, holy, holy is going to be repeated by the uh, angels or the heavenly host that's surrounding them. So this is one of those things that where there's where there is God, there is also kind of these chants of holy, holy, holy. Uh, God is holy. Um, he's pure. He, he, he's, he fills things with glory. Again, which would have been totally different from what was happening in Israel at the time. It would have been uh, wildly foreign to the people of Israel. They had forgotten about God, so to speak. Uh, so Isaiah continues in verse 5 and says, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So Isaiah sees God, sees his glory, sees his holiness, and the first thing out of his mouth is, Woe to me, for I am unworthy. And then he goes on and explains why. He says, oh, I have unclean lips, and uh, I live among a people of unclean lips. And he says, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So Isaiah is essentially saying, I am not pure, and the people I live among are not pure, and I'm, I'm looking at you. I should be struck on the spot, so to speak, for example. Uh, the, the people were, people kind of had this idea. That's why um, non, anyone except the high priest on one day of a year couldn't go into the most holy of holy places because if you entered with impurity, then uh, you were essentially making uh, the area unclean and the Lord wouldn't visit because the Lord can't be in places that are unclean. So that's kind of the response of Isaiah. Um, and so my question based, upon, uh, based off of that is, what does that attitude look like today? Because obviously we don't have visions of the Lord like Isaiah is having right here, but what, what attitude that Isaiah is portraying here, how do we translate that into our attitude about the presence of the Lord and how we interact with him today. What does that look like? <clears throat> um, the whole thing can be, you know, compared to, to us today. I mean, are are our lips unclean? Mm -hmm. And I I know my you know it's 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 the same as earlier on. It's uh, it's just it, it's something that can be applied to you know our own behavior. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> it definitely can be applied to our own behavior. But I also wonder too if if what Isaiah is portraying here, the way it could apply to us is do we acknowledge God's presence enough among us? Uh, do we acknowledge God enough? Because unlike Isaiah's time where people of Israel thought God was confined to a temple, or uh, they, they kind of put God in a box. We know better. We know that God is not in a box. God is not confined in a temple. Instead, you know, he, he is everywhere. He's inside of us. And we have verses like, you know, wherever two or more gather in my name, I am there. So we are in the presence of God. We know much more fully than kind of what Isaiah is happening there. And I wonder if acknowledging that, and realizing that, hey, we're in the presence of God a lot more would change some of our behaviors sometimes and how we interact with other people and how we, you know, 
behave, what we do with our time, just uh, kind of a thought to carry with us. Any comments on that? Oh, uh, you're muted, Jim. Okay. I, I think it's interesting that Isaiah kind of says the same thing that John says. Isaiah first sees mm -hmm. God come and basically give him the revelation. Right. He reacted the same as John. And because uh, John said he fell down is dead. And, right. Uh, it's basically saying the same thing. I'm just nothing. We kind of do the same thing. We come for his glory. We surrender. We give up our lives. We die to Christ. Mm -hmm. and that's what happens if you come into his presence, I guess. Because you know you can't control it. He's, he's the Almighty. Right, he's absolutely. Saved. Yeah, uh, I think that that is a very good point. I think it also kind of shows that God uses people. Uh, God uses broken people. God uses people that are not perfectly clean. Um, and that that's not the point. The point is that God makes us clean uh, through the blood of Christ. We know that. But more than that, that when God chooses his servant to be a prophet or to go on a mission field or uh, to, you know, song lead or any of the, these other things, that, that doesn't mean we're, um, that doesn't mean that we're perfect. And it doesn't mean that if we're imperfect, we can't do what God has asked us. Uh, yeah. Was that? I mean, she's raising her hand to talk. Oh, okay. So you have to okay. okay. Uh, when? Yes, I see it. Oh, this is neat. I love technology. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, okay. Well, you know, if all of us had, you know how people put on their cards a little fish mm -hmm. to indicate that they're a Christian? Yes. Well, if all of us had a text on our bed that indicated that we were Christian, there would be a lot of things that we would not do. Absolutely. Absolutely. How, how we would act, because it, as you said, we are the presence of God. Right. All, all of us were like when we go to the grocery store, or how would we act in traffic? Do you see what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, that, absolutely. That when someone are a Christian, and you are saying, okay, here I am the ambassador for Christ. Mm -hmm. I realize that we know that, but we don't always act that way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh I would say that is true to an extent, but then I would also I would also kind of bring up the idea that I mean the Israelites they had the temple, um, they had the stories of the Old Testament, which for us you know they're two thousand years old. For the Israelites they were two hundred years old or, or something like that, and yet it didn't matter to them anyway. And so I think in some respects you're right. For a lot of people, if, you know, the idea was that you're interacting with uh, uh, Christians or with fellow brothers and sisters all the time, we would act differently or in a certain better way. But I think over time, we would, it might become, if we weren't careful, it could become similar to the Israelites where uh, we just, it doesn't matter anymore. You know, uh, okay. You call yourself a Christian. That's just a name. Uh, that's just a that's just a signifier. Just like the Israelites, they had the temple, 
didn't mean they had to act right all the time. Just kind of a, a thought. Frankie said unworthiness. Yes. Yes. What I what say is that we need to remind ourselves that that tattoo is on our forehead, so to speak. Absolutely. In other words, that we need to remind ourselves we are God's ambassador, that we are God's tool for Him. Absolutely. Yes, totally agree, totally agree. Yes, and you're right. Isaiah was feeling unworthy. He was feeling like he wasn't good enough. And that's why I really love the next uh, couple of verses in Isaiah 6. It says, Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. So God uh, hears, God even acknowledges that Isaiah is unworthy, but he takes that unworthiness away. He removes that guilt. He takes away that guilt. Very similar to what Christ is continually doing for us. And, And that's one of the things. God, when he calls someone, when he... Uh, puts out the call for his servants, he removes obstacles. God, for his called people, will never put obstacles in the path. So Isaiah says he is unworthy, and he is, and God removes that unworthiness. He purifies him. He cleanses him, uh, which I think is, is very applicable to today because you know when people feel as if they've been called, they, people can have a ton of excuses. They can say, well, you know, there's this obstacle in the way, or there's this that's preventing me from doing what I want to do, or there's this preventing me from what God wants to do. Uh, all kinds of different struggles, time, money, uh, you know, willingness to do it. And if you trust in God, if you allow him to, he will take those obstacles away. That's what he did for Isaiah, which makes the next part just so outstanding as an example of what we should be like when we are, you know, wanting to be called from God. So he removes the guilt and then it switches to first person in verse eight. It says, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. So as soon as that obstacle is removed, he hears this voice and he hears uh, the Lord asking, who am I going to send? Who is going to be sent? And Isaiah says, you know, I'm here. Here am I. Send me. That willingness is there. I think that's um, just extremely, extremely important uh, to have because uh, we've got to want to serve God. At the end of the day, God, God desires our total devotion to him. He wants us to want to serve him. Because at the end of the day, if you don't want to do what you're doing, you're either going to give up halfway, you're not going to put in full effort, you're not going to give it 100%. And so God wants us to put all our our all in, and uh, he wants us to want to serve him. And so that response by Isaiah of he hears the call and he doesn't think, well, Zechariah, that prophet, he's down the street. He can go instead. Or I heard there was this really holy guy, this really holy priest, and he, he's been chomping at the bit to serve God, so we'll put him in charge. Instead, he hears the call and says, I can do it, send me. Uh, A great example, I think, of the response we should have uh, to God's call today. And it might not be, it's probably not going to be like Isaiah's where he walks in the temple and sees this glorious vision of God. But, you know, 
our calls, each and every one of us has been called to do something in some way to the best of our ability. Any comments or questions about that? Cool, cool. I agree. All right. <laughs> um, and then after Isaiah answers, God says, he said, go and tell the people. And he goes on and says specifically what uh, Isaiah is supposed to go and tell the people. But uh, that, that's kind of the idea. here. Isaiah had an obstacle in his way. He gets, he, he gets the call from the Lord. He sees this obstacle. The Lord removes it. Isaiah becomes willing, and so the Lord uses him. And uh, that same kind of mantra can be used and utilized by us today because the Lord is still calling people. Uh, the Lord is still wanting people to do his work. Uh, and so I think it's important that we kind of envelop this mindset of Isaiah of being willing to answer the call because uh, the Lord wants to use us. I think that's a pretty good place to wrap it up uh, here. We'll continue, I think, next week, unless there's anything else. Maybe in a prayer. Okay, I can do that. Let's end with a prayer today. And uh, we'll leave it on so people can chat and everything. After Justin, who want to? Yes, sir. Can you include uh, Thanksgiving for my biopsy results? I sure can. Uh, they came back showing no cancer. Uh, last time it showed one out of twelve samples had some, but they were unable to find any. Just a few precancerous cells, so it's staying very, very pain. Okay. Anybody else before I start praying? Is there anything else somebody wants to add? Okay, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you for our opportunity to gather together. We're thankful that we have this kind of technology that allows us to still um, uh, worship together and study together and um, and be together um, as, a, as a congregation and as followers of you. And um, Father, we just want to say thank you to you for uh, the good report that Steve got. And we're uh, just very, very thankful. and um, we just pray that, that will, he will continue to have the same reports over uh, time and that um, uh, the, the count will stay low. And, Father, we're just um, grateful that uh, there's a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel for this, that we see that there's um, in the near future or opportunity to uh, spend more time with other people and get out and about again. And um, we just pray that you continue to keep people safe and healthy. and.